if yesterday we were talking like bread and butter, today and tomorrow we are going to discuss some really advanced stuff. Okay, so here even people which are you know into PKI and so on, I think a lot of them are going to hear new stuff. Uh, almost sure. Okay, and today we are focusing on revocation, uh, and tomorrow we are going to uh, focus on transparency. Revocation, of course, is a very well-known feature of uh, of uh, PKI. It has been there for all along. It's a basic feature. However. There have been major problems with revocation all along. So you will see there have been all kinds of different approaches and so on. And I, actually, it seems that we still are not uh, really, we did not really converge to a solution that everybody is happy with. When I say we did not converge, I mean more, more in the practical sense of you know, deployed systems, because I think the solutions I'll describe at the end of the talk are actually pretty, pretty sufficient for deployment and for use, but they are not deployed yet, right? So the, we are still talking about things which are changing, which are evolving, and if you guys will have better ideas, then this is the time to propose them and to actually be able to influence what the community will converge on. Okay, so this is very exciting area. As you can see in the, in the title, however, today and tomorrow, I will also discuss a bit Merkel Digest schemes, what most of us usually refer to as Merkel trees, but this is a generalization of that concept. Uh, I will describe it a bit during the presentation, so that's why I mention it here, uh, and also because it's extremely important, and uh, I think our community, while we are using them very much, I mean, I'm sure all of you have seen Merkel trees uh, at least a few times, right? But uh, I, I think this is, a, one, again, one of the basic mechanisms we use in cryptography, which is kind of, does not get the re respect it deserves, not defined well, and so on. So we'll also discuss these a bit because they are used extensively both for evocation and also to more for transparency. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, oh, and let me also just mention quickly that if you want to see more details of all of the stuff I'm talking about, they're all covered in this uh, textbook I'm working on of Applied Introduction to Cryptography. It's all available online. You're welcome to look it up, and if you have any comments, suggestions, or whatever, please do send it because it probably will be published uh, in the next year. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's begin. So what we will cover, so we had yesterday introduction, uh, X509, the basics essentially, today revocations in Merkel Digest, and specifically we'll talk, basically we'll begin with, the, with the kind of understanding this challenge, why is this ch such a challenging problem, and then I'll talk essentially about two approaches. Uh, each of these approaches will have several techniques, right, so it's not just two techniques, but two basic approaches. The first approach will be prefetching of revocation. So we get the, the revocation information to the, the browser before the browser is going to any website. And the, I'll talk there about three uh, techniques of doing it. The first one, I'm sure everybody heard about our CRS, certi uh, Certificate Revocation Lists. I'm sure you heard about these, but I'll still talk about them a bit in some of the details you, you may not be familiar, or maybe you are. And then I'll talk about VRLs, which uh, actually is my term. It's not exactly standard term. There isn't yet a standard term for this. So I refer to them as vendor revocation lists. These are revocation lists, revocation list, lists of revocations, which are sent from the vendor, from the vendor of the browser of, or whatever client software it is. And there are different terms for this, but actually most major browsers these days have this some sort with a different name and with some different properties, but basically the same idea of VRLs. Okay, so I'll talk about that, this a bit, and then I'll talk about a new proposal just from this year called CRV, Certificate Revocation Vector, which is uh, uh, trying to, to make a more efficient solution for prefetched, uh, prefetching of revocation information, and indeed it is much more efficient than CRLs. Um, so that's what uh, will be this first part about prefetching of revocations. 
And then I'll talk about the, the other approach, which is just-in-time fetching of revocation information, uh, which is most well known by the OCSP protocol. And I'll talk about OCSP and some of its variants. There are several important variants of this protocol. So that is what we will cover today, okay? Tomorrow, as I mentioned, we'll talk about certificate transparency and a bit motivated by talking about this whole issue of CA failures, failures of certificate authorities. Okay, so let's begin certificate revocations. Well, sometimes, you know, certificates must be revoked. And while there are multiple reasons one could revoke certificates, in the standard there's a whole list of potential reasons. The main reason that we are interested in, of course, is security. Certificates being revoked because of security concerns. And th these concerns may be concerns that the key, the private key, that the, the, the corresponding public key is being certified, that private key may have been compromised, or at least we may be, you know, concerned that the key, we may have some reason to think or suspect that the private key may have been compromised. And then, of course, we want to immediately revoke the relevant certificate, right? Second option is that the CA was compromised. And I mentioned you know, this whole table of uh, famous incidents. Some of these famous incidents involved definitely the uh, compromise of an entire certificate authority. Uh, we just heard the news and we saw how some very serious uh, services, which are supposed to be extremely well protected, can still be compromised. So yeah, a CA could be compromised. And then, of course, we need to revoke all of the certificates that it issued. And uh, actually, I see that I forgot to mention here, but another reason that will require us to do major revocation of a lot of certificates is when we discover some vulnerability, which may have caused the compromise of many keys, not of one key, but many keys which are using the same product. And that happened uh, in some instances already and may happen again in the future. So, uh, Finally, there are also non-security purposes, kind of administrative reasons for revoking, but that's, of course, less of a concern to us. In any case, once we need to revoke a certificate, or, many, or in some cases, as we saw, many certificates, we, need, we have this challenge. How do we inform the relying parties about it? And the kind of dual of it, if the certificate was not revoked, how do we ensure the relying party that the certificate was not revoked, which I refer to it as PONR or, or proof of non-revocation. Now, uh, you yesterday already mentioned a bit this kind of proof, proof of, of uh, misbehavior in particular, so it's in proof of inclusion. So this concept of proving stuff is a basic thing, in my opinion, it's a basic thing in general in applied cryptography and uh, we don't see it enough, but in this area of PKI, I think it's extremely essential uh, or, and basic. We'll see much more of this kind of proofs of stuff. Uh, and in particular, we have this proof of non-revocation, which means some way for the relying party to know for sure that the, the certificate was not revoked at a particular time, of course. So that's one, one uh, question. How do we inform the relying parties? And in particular, when? When do we inform the relying party? And here we have these two basic approaches. The first is we inform the relying parties of revocations and non-revocations periodically, regardless of whether the relying party is approaching a particular website, for example, in some daily process, right? So that's called what we call prefetching of revocation information. The other option is just in time informing the, the relying party just in time when uh, we are revoking, the, when, when the relying party is approaching the website or whatever it needs to know. And then when they need to know, then we will uh, give them the information about the revocation. Okay, so uh, these are the two main options and we'll separate our discussion between these two main options. So, you know, to prefetch or not to prefetch, that is the question here. Okay, so let's begin with prefetching and the most the basic and well-known method of revocation in general, although not, the definitely not the most widely used, but the first defined, the most well-known is the certificate revocation list or CRL. And 
The idea is extremely simple. The CI will simply sign a list of all revoked certificates. So it's a signature by the CA over a list or a set containing certificate number and date, date of revocation. So there could be many certificates here. And then uh, we, uh, uh, we have uh, um, Issued and expires. Um, oh, oh, okay, okay, I forgot. That. Sorry. Uh, and we have the time when the CRL itself was issued, and the time that the CRL itself is expiring. That is the time that we are supposed to get a new CRL. When is uh, should we expect a new CRL to be to arrive? And when this CRL was issued, so we can check that we have the fresh CRL information that we can rely on it. And there could be also extensions which are similar to the X509 extensions. Again, really beautiful mechanism, but let's not get into it again. We covered it yesterday, right? And this single signature covers all the revocations in the CRL. So from the signature processing, the amount of computation we need to perform, this is extremely efficient. Just one signature for all of the revocations that you are informing everybody about. So, from that point of view, this is an extremely efficient mechanism. I guess many, many years ago when this was uh, uh, designed, uh, people were very concerned about the computational complexity of public key operations. So the, this fact that it's one signature operation was probably very important. Uh, today, I guess it's a, a bit less important. And actually CRLs can be used both in the pre, in prefetch, but also not in prefetch mode. So in the prefetch mode, you, we will download the CRL from the CA, from all CAs actually, in advance. And in the, this point of there being multiple CAs is a big problem for this uh, for this point because there's a lot of CAs. So what daily you will download all of the certificate of the CRLs of all the different CAs. There will be a lot of downloads, a lot of storage involved. Maybe we are not even going to go to any website that is going to use these CAs. I mean, there are hundreds of CAs, okay? So that approach is a bit problematic, right? Uh, and in fact, we may not even be aware of all CAs initially if we may get, get suddenly a certificate for a CA by some other uh, root authority. Option two is just in time. So as I mentioned, just in time, we will download the CRL when we are validating the certificate. And in fact, that's a more common design for a CRL, although originally I think the design was more in the prefetching approach. And in general, I will put the CRL approach, I did put it in the prefetching approach. Uh, well, mostly because it's very similar to the other prefetching approaches I will talk about afterwards. So this advantage in doing it just in time is the delay. The delay when you enter the website, and or the potential failure if you don't get it. And because CRL can be so much information, then it is quite possible that you will uh, just, uh, it will not be realistic or it will even fail because it is happening uh, when you enter the website is not the right time to begin downloading a lot of information or to depend on it, right? So overall, the mechanism, if you do it with prefetching, maybe not with, maybe just in time is problematic, but if you do it with prefetching, you don't have so much information, you download it daily, maybe it's not so bad. But the question is, is it really so rare? Are revocations so rare? And as you can understand, the, the answer is no. So revocations are actually quite common. And essentially, Significant fraction of the certificates may be revoked at any given time, okay? And here, if you we see a graph from a walk by Liu and uh, et al from IMC 15, and you can see here that the, the y-axis is the fraction of certificates which are currently valid by their expiration time. That's what they refer to as fresh certificates and they've been revoked, okay? So that's like, if we preload, that's the amount of the certificates we need to keep. Y-axis is giving in, in as a fraction. So if this is 0 0.1, it means 10%, one, one in 10 certificates. Now, as you understand, there are 
millions upon millions, many millions of certificates around, if we need to, to download 10% of this, this is a really large data that we need to download every time, every day, essentially, right? That's completely impractical. Impractical if you do it just in time, also impractical if you do it by prefetching. That will be really, really too much. Okay, uh, you see about the separation between all certificates and this EV certificates, which I hope that you recognize as this extended validation certificates that we discussed yesterday. And you see that the number, even for EV certificates, the numbers are still pretty high. Okay, and okay, so that's a problem. Oh, and if you wonder what was this big spike here about May of uh, 2014, this is of course because of the heart bleed bug uh, of vulnerabilities that was exposed around that time, which caused a lot of, a lot of, of uh, uh, private keys to be suspected at being actually exposed. And therefore, a lot of websites had to change the public keys, uh, private keys and public keys and get new certificates. That's why we had this very, very big spike in, um, in revocations, okay? And actually some studies have shown that the number of revocations should have been even higher because there were quite a lot of websites that, did, that in spite of this being so published and, and well known and so on, they, they actually took them a lot, a lot of time until they actually changed and revoked their certificates and so on. So the spike should have been even higher, okay? Uh, so that could happen again, definitely, okay? We could have, more of these very high spikes and, and very high number of evocations, we have to be prepared for that. As I mentioned, sometimes we, we can also have some CAs which have to be, all the certificates need to be revoked because uh, the, their uh, public key, uh, private key was exposed. So we cannot assume that certificates are so rare, okay? And of course, even before that, you see, we are not talking about zero percentages, we are talking still about non-negligible amount of, of evocations. Okay, so we need to try to do it in a more efficient way. How? Well, one thing is to say, oh, if it takes a lot of overhead to do this CRLs, let's just do them less frequently, reduce the frequency of CRLs, and then the overhead, the amortized overhead will be low. But then we get a real serious freshness concern, you know, the CRLs are not fresh. That is actually the, Reality that happened in the you know, when people begin began to realize there's a problem in CRS, they began to use use CRS which were less and less fresh, so it became really a problem. The second alternative is to try to improve the CRL, and indeed people have worked and defined more efficient variants of the CRL scheme. So I'll talk about three of these. The first is the most trivial CRL distribution point, which just means if I'm a CA, I don't need to put all of my certificates in one CRL, I will can have multiple different CRLs, yes? And then uh, I, will, uh, I will only need to get a CRL containing the relevant certificate, so this will be less information, and the, overhead, the number of revocations will probably be smaller too, and therefore I will reduce the overhead for that particular, for checking for that particular uh, website I'm visiting now. Now, if you notice, this is really only helpful if we are checking for evocations only for the website that we are visiting now. That is only, it's a just-in-time approach. It doesn't help us at all if we are following the prefetching approach, which actually I'm focusing on now, right? So distribution points are really actually not really relevant for the approach of, of uh, prefetching, right? Because if you prefetch everything, what does it help you that you've split them into multiple different CRLs? You prefetch all CRLs, right? So that's completely irrelevant distribution points. Okay, second approach. Second approach says, oh, you know, yes, you can have many certificates which are, which are revoked, but we really, really care only about important CR, you know, certificates what are important certificates? Certificates of uh, mostly about CA certificates, certificates of, of intermediate CAs, or of course, heaven forbid, of root CAs, right? So authority vocation list, ARLs, are simply a vocation list which contains only the uh, certificates, a vocation of certificates 
of authorities, uh, certificate authorities intermediate or root certificate authorities, yes? So this can be maintained better, this can be prefetched for sure, right? And that's definitely a useful technique. As in a sense, it is a technique which is in use with some small variant, as I'll talk in a moment, this is the VRL that I'll talk about soon. Okay. One other approach that could be done is, and actually that's very useful approach, is Delta CRLs. Delta CRLs means that I don't send you, I don't need to resend you again and again and again all the revocations, right? Because you already received most of them, right? I mean, I really need to send you only the Delta from yesterday or from your last download. So that really improves a lot the efficiency of the CRL mechanism. Uh, and it is standardized. However, uh, it does have also a significant disadvantage that is it makes it harder to prove non-revocation, to prove that your certificate was not, a particular certificate was not revoked. You need now to look at all the Delta CRLs you received, at the main CRL you received, to look in all of these separate lists or to merge them and to check for a particular certificate. Now, if we are talking about preloading, you need to do this process all the time. And if you want to somehow go later to a court and say, oh, I got this document and it is signed and I have checked for non-revocation, then you will need a, the protocol for doing it and for convincing becomes more complex, less efficient and so on. And mm, quite possibly, you will not find implementations for it. You, you could, of course, do your own implementation, but currently I don't think you will find any implementation for it, you know, to convince the judge and so on. While if you're working in a simple CRL scheme, you could actually find such mechanisms available. Uh, and I guess that's another example of this whole importance of this area of proof that you can prove stuff, that you can prove that the certificate was not revoked, stuff like that. Okay, so these are the CRL-based variations. And then, as I mentioned a few times, there's also this vendor revocation list, v or v VRL. And again, this is my own term because there isn't, currently there, is, there isn't a standard term for this approach in the, in the industry or community. Uh, the industry in particular uses several different terms, but each vendor uses their own terms for this. But the idea is very simple. Uh, the vendor, the manufacturer of the browser or whatever client software it is, they collect all of the revocations or more likely actually all of the important revocations, okay? So the, this will be one list containing revocations from all the CAs the, and it is maintained by the vendor. It does not mean it necessarily will contain all revocations. It contains revocations from all CAs. So this is, and, and normally the vendors will not contain all revocations here, but only what they consider to be important revocations. Uh, for example, like the ARLs, right? Only these main revocation things. And indeed this mechanism, the VRL is currently the most important, most widely used, and sometimes the only revocation mechanism. Now, if anybody, I guess maybe I should have put here a foil about uh, the, the long tail of distribution of internet websites, and that's a well-known phenomenon that, yes, there are some websites which are very popular, you know, YouTube and Google and, and some other, you know, very popular websites, that's great, you know, like in our community, probably SKCD, right, whatever. So that, that's, there are these very popular websites. However, there's a long tail of less popular websites and still they are being used a lot. These less popular websites uh, actually represent a very large fraction of what browsers are using. Therefore, by protecting only the most popular websites, we are protecting only a, a fraction of what users actually are using. So that is the VRL's approach is definitely not sufficient, although it's very good and it is pretty efficient because they do limit it to a reasonable number of uh, evocations. And it is definitely a prefetch mechanism. So the browser is just downloading it, you know, on a daily basis or whatever, okay? So what can we do if we want really to protect all certificates? So continuing the, the uh, prefetched approach, 
Uh, then one solution will be, okay, let's revoke using CRVs, not CRLs. We just need to understand what are CRVs, of course. And I'm using the term let's revoke because this is the name of the relevant paper by Smith, Dickinson, and S Simmons from NDSS of this year. Okay, a very nice paper with wonderful graphics. I think I, I copied one of them too because they are so nice. Um, which proposed a very nice approach, a very efficient approach, for improving the uh, handling of revocation uh, with the prefetching mechanism, okay? So the CRV is, is essentially a bit vector of uh, revo revoked certificates. So instead of a CRL, which is a list, we'll have a bit vector, just zero or one. You know, one for revoked, zero for non-revoked, and that is one bit per, per certificate, okay? And the name of it, CRV, is Certificate Revocation Vector. Instead of a list, this is a vector, a bit vector specifically, right? So how is it done? First thing, they add, uh, or they propose to add, a revocation number, a number for each certificate. So each certificate will have this kind of consecutive number. Uh, so this will be counting certificates which are issued by the same CA, except they're all restricted to have the same expiration date. For, so for each expiration date, for every CA, every expiration date, you have a different vector, okay? A different of this CRV or different bit vector of revocations, okay? So we refer to CERT by the CA, date of expiration, and then this number R, it identifies specific certificate from this particular CA and expiring on this given date, and with the number, the vocation number R, okay? That's identifying a certificate. And then, the, uh, if, if the CRV, the CRV is vector, if the bit is one, that means that the certificate was revoked, okay? And the browsers are prefetching pre these signed CRVs from the CA in kind of a daily process. So, okay? Uh, that's a CRV mechanism, and uh, I think quite already intuitively you can see that it could require transmission of much less information, just one bit per certificate, right? So it's very nice. In fact, they have some further tricks for improving further the efficiency. First of all, these vectors are, uh, clearly should be much can, very unbalanced, there will be many more zeros unrevoked than revoked, right? So we can definitely compress them very well. They compress very well, right? Uh, and basically the compression works by simply, it's, well, it's a simply like, a, the compression they proposed is essentially a simplified lempel zip kind of compression. You just simply send the length of the zero bits of the non-revoked sequences. That's essentially the compression. So instead of sending the vector itself, you actually, usually what you do is you send the identifiers of the one bit. So you send, okay, you have five zero bits, so you just send the number five. Then how many zeros do I have until the next one? I have a hundred zeros, so you just send the number hundred. So what you send is simply this list of numbers, and so it's very compact, okay? And another another trick they have proposed is to send this, uh, this service actually only in kind of Delta CRV, so only the revocations that happened since yesterday. So I don't need to resend, to, to send each time all the revocations, only the new revocations. And then of course the compression becomes even much, much more efficient, right? And what is the result? Well, the length of this update, even for, uh, if we have in this group of the, of the revocations from, from a particular CA, particular date of up to 90 million certificates, uh, then in reasonable revocation percentages, they get up to 22 kilobytes, not too much information for, for sending, right? So that seems pretty you know, much better. And of course, you can see the paper for the details for some additional variants, and, and uh, most importantly, for some really beautiful graphs. Well, of course, I cannot resist, and I did copy the graphs here. Now, I hope you all agree with me. These are some of the most beautiful graphs we can have in cryptography. Uh, so, well, if you don't, then you don't. But that's, uh, I, I think they have really done a very nice job here. Uh, okay, so uh, now, 
Of course, uh, I'm not the author in this paper, so you know, it's in our community. If you're not the author, then you must also criticize. Well, these are all friends of mine, so I'm not criticized too much, but uh, still, I'll, uh, you know, mention some of the fine prints that you may not uh, notice immediately if you if you read the paper. It may be a bit harder to notice them. So I'll mention these uh, fine, you know, small details in you know, problematic details in kind of rough order of increasing problematic. Okay, the first problem I want to mention is the revocation numbers. So there are two problems with them. The first problem is, is uh, I think a bit theoretical, but you s but actually in X509 or you know, in the world of certificates, every issue like that can become very problematic if you want to do it, really deploy it because it's industry and, and you have to get agreement. So the problem is that this is a potential exposure the fact that you use sequential revocation numbers could be a potential exposure from the, of the number of certificates issued by a particular CA. And this is not a, it may look to you absurd. I mean, does it really matter to the CA that I will know how many certificates they issue or, and so on? But uh, I, it may be in particular, the X509 serial numbers are random and they are required to be random probably to mostly to protect this privacy of the CA and maybe to protect against some you know, attacks of, of an attacker knowing in advance the serial number. So this is a one potential problem, this potential exposure of the serial, of the, the fact that the revocation number are sequential could cause some problem in trying to adopt this. I think not a big one, but I could be wrong. Second issue, is much more uh, problematic. This, just by the fact we need to add these new numbers, it means that, that this entire method requires a new extension to be available in every certificate. So again, you could say, well, but this is a trivial extension, what's the big deal? But, you know, some one of the areas I'm very interested in is exactly deployability of, of standards, yes? It's a much, so if you have not tried to work in this area, we'll be amazed when you do, to find how complex this issue is of deployment of new standards and new technologies. It is very complex. And uh, so this small requirement can be actually a huge stumbling block because if you want to deploy this, you need to essentially convince everybody to add this extension. This could be a big problem. Next problem is that, is actually, I think, more serious. It's a performance problem. CRVs are per CA and per expiration date. Now, in the Red PK, we only have hundreds of CAs, and definitely there are many expiration dates, right? I mean, then every day in the year could be an expiration date. And for the certificate that we have now, there could be expiration date even farther in the future. So there are many expiration dates potentially, which means there are many, many CRVs, right? Like at least 10,000, and you need to send them daily for every relying party. That's a lot of information, even if each CRV is not so long, but if you multiply it by th these numbers, we are talking about huge amounts of information. And that's a big problem, okay? So we still have high overhead, even with the CRVs, although they definitely re de reduce our overhead significantly compared to CRLs. And yeah, some combination of the uh, of this uh, CRV technique with the VRL technique may, of course, be good. But that is also very problematic because of the, these revocation numbers have to be numbers of a sequential number of a specific expiration date. And now we have div. If we want the VRL is supporting different CAs, so how can we have one set of revocation numbers, a sequential set of revocation numbers? It is a diff so the revocation number become again a big problem. Okay. Okay. So this very nice design of let's revoke with CRVs, although it improved a lot, is still problematic. What can we do? Well, maybe we shouldn't prefetch. Oh, yeah. I just see that this take took me much longer than I, it felt like. It felt like quickly, okay, but uh, no, we are running out of time. Hmm. Okay, so second approach is just in time fetching. Okay, this second approach with several techniques, and that's actually where I think 
industry is already mostly is in this direction. And I think this will be the direction of the future. Okay, so what is this OCSP? First, what it stands for, if you don't know, so it's Online Certificate Status Protocol. Oh, just a protocol where you ask for the status of a certificate when you need it. And indeed, most browsers don't prefetch most certificates, except for these VRLs, right? They don't use the CRLs, they just use VRL vendor list, for example, one CRL, and, and these contain only some certificates, and the CRVs are not deployed. So usually what browsers are doing, if they do anything, and some browsers simply don't do, by the way, yeah, even Chrome essentially doesn't do anything. So they do this just in time check for evocation, okay? Which means that they go and ask the server, usually the CA itself, you know, please give me the status of these certificates by the number, by the number of the certificates, and the response is signed. The response from the server is signed, from the CA is signed, saying this is revoked, this is not revoked for these particular certificates you asked about, yes? And it also says when it was produced and it is signed. Okay, simple approach, yes? And uh, this is how it's used in a typical browsing, very simple. The TLS client go to the website, client hello, server send server hello, uh, and the client, that's just the TLS protocol. I mean, if you don't know TLS, it's, it doesn't matter so much uh, for our purposes. Uh, it matters a lot because uh, you should know TLS, right? I mean, we are in a conference in cryptography, so you, know, you do learn TLS, okay? And then the client goes to the, OCSP responder, usually the CA, yeah, send the OCSP request for the status of this certificate and gets a response, signed response, and checks it, everything okay, we can continue the connection, everything fine. Okay, great. Now, everything fine except that we do have some serious concerns with this, and with this what I will refer to, what I showed before as classical OCSP use. Okay, because the protocol does not say you must use it in this way. For example, that the client must do the OCSP request. The protocol just defined OCSP request, OCSP response, right? So this is just how people usually think about deploying it, what they refer to as classic OCSP. And some serious concerns about it, okay? What are these concerns? First of all, delay. There are significant added delay to the page load because you wait for the response. Everything you, de you do just in time, if you do communication, means you add delay to the operation, to the loading of the page. That's a big deal, even if the delay is not so large. And then reliability, what if the delay does not arrive? And you wait, you wait a second, you wait two seconds, you're not loading the page, the browser is waiting. Five seconds, how long would you wait? What do you do if you don't get a response, right? Uh, would you also resend? If you don't get a response, would you resend your request to ask for a response? If you resend, it's more overhead on the network, on the client, on everybody. And, and how much time to wait until you decide, oh, I'm just not going to get a response. If it's short, then this means the attacker will be able to cause you not to get a response by some small denial of service attack. If it's long, then you even, you know, delay even more the loading of the page if you have a loss. So this is a big problem. And what most browsers are doing is they say, okay, you know, we'll wait a bit and then uh, a second maybe, and then we just soft fail. Soft fail means we continue the connection as if we got a good response or we just give up on OCSP. Okay, now, you know, is this uh, secure? Well, you know, we know it's not, right? So then of course it opened us to this very obvious soft fail attack, many the middle attack. So here's the attacker. Client connects to the attacker, client hello, sending the server hello with a revoked certificate. The key has been exposed. Client, poor client is sending the OCC request, but this is the man in the middle, so he drops the response or the request or both of them or whatever, right? And then we time out, we soft fail, so we just continue and that's it. We are connected to the attacker. Clearly not satisfactory from the security point of view, is it, right? So, Soft fail is too soft. Why would anybody do this, right? Why don't do soft OCSP without the soft fail? I mean, this is like stupid, right? Uh, you know, do hard fail. If you don't get OCSP, you refuse the connection. Well, so why don't they do it? So I'll give you one answer. 
Well, that's a great idea. Oh, these Google and Microsoft and Apple guys are really stupid. They don't know security. They just don't understand. They are stupid, right? So that's one answer, right? Another answer is, you know, no way. I mean, if we are a browser company, we are not going to adopt this hard fail approach because users will simply switch to another browser which is not doing it. And here we have a very important principle, which is not so much uh, specific to PKI, of course, which is, but I do want to offer it to you. It's what I call my precedence rule, which is user experience is beating security whenever you go to practical scenarios, right? So if I am a, a, you know, a product company, I care about security, yes, of course, but I care much more about users user experience about user people using my system that's life security guys realize you should realize we are at the bottom of the food chain okay the vendors prefer user experience that's how it is we must find ways to have security with user experience otherwise there will be no security okay that's life okay so we have these concerns with the uh, classic user for CSP. Actually, we have three concerns. I mentioned this delay in reliability, which is uh, this problem here, but actually we have two more concerns. So let me mention these two. First of all, privacy. Whenever we do this OCSP request, the website, the CA, excuse me, the CA or whatever the OCSP responder, usually the CA, they get to see which domain we are checking at on, right? So they learn that we are visiting that particular domain. Sometimes we may not want that, right? So that's one problem. Second is the CIs don't like that solution because of it brings a lot of load on them. It brings denial of service. Uh, now, the denial of, so it could be a real denial of service because it's very easy to abuse this mechanism to cause at the same time many, many clients to do this OCSP request. It's really a trivial attack for attackers to do. And then also, it uh, uh, it also can happen just by chance because many clients suddenly go to some you know, some website. Sometimes people are jumping to a website because they got this link and many on the social network and so on. Suddenly we have thousands and thousands of people going to the same website. And then we'll have this load again. Okay, so what is the solution? Uh, so there is a solution, an, an alternative way of using OCSP, which is called OCSP stabling. And that means that this OCSP is run by the web server, not by the client. And the web server is doing the OCSP request, getting the OCSP response, and then what we call stapling it with its own, with a certificate itself in the TLS connection. So when the client connects to the server, the server already has the OCSP response in advance, the server got it in advance, and then they just send the OCSP response to the client, the client just check the time on the OCSP response. If it is fresh enough, then they just, the client can just use it, okay? And that improves, improve efficiency, privacy, reliability. There is, well, I guess in security always, right? There is a small caveat here, and that is that unfortunately, I guess it is related to the deployment challenge I mentioned before. Unfortunately, many servers don't do this stapling. And even maybe worse, Many servers stable sometimes, they stable usually or whatever, but not always. And that is a big problem, okay? Because what do you do if you don't get the stable thing, right? The server should stable, yeah, but they don't. So what do you do? They don't always stable. Maybe they don't support OCSP at all. Maybe they support, but not always. What do we do? Do we try classic OCSP? I guess we do, but then, Again, what do we do if we don't get a response? We soft fail again, which means we have the same attack. So this is the same attack essentially with this small variant that you hope that the server will staple, they don't staple and then you're stuck, right? So that's essentially the situation and uh, uh, that's not good enough, right? Because we are still vulnerable. So there is also a, a proposal of dealing with that, which is called the mass staple extension. That's an X509 extension. So you, I hope you remember this mechanism of X, X509 extensions because I told you that's the most beautiful thing about X509, at least in my opinion, right? And, and uh, so if the certificate of, this, the, of the web server from the CA 
contains this mass staple extension, then the hardware will, the client will hard fail if the response is not stable. So that says, I website, I assure you, I will always staple. I will make sure that I will always have OCSP response. I will always staple. If you don't get a stable response from me, don't connect to me, right? It is marked as a non-critical extension because some browsers may not support it and that's okay. They can continue as they like, but uh, they can soft fail or whatever, they will be less secure, but uh, browsers that support it will know never to continue without the stapling. So here is a, a client and here is an attacker trying to attack without stapling as before, and the client just refuses, hard fail, aborts, maybe reports, and so on. So that actually is a good secure mechanism, right? Yes, it, uh, I would hope this will be deployed much more. And now uh, let's optimize because all that we discussed was not really optimization. And the OCSP stepping does re reduce the overhead already because we have one signature and one response per website. So that's much better actually from the, the load on the, the CA. But still, this overhead of revocation is still pretty high. Uh, in particular, we need a separate signature, a separate message for every website. And we need to send, send this periodically. So we need to sign for every, you know, for every uh, certificate that the CIA has issued. They need to sign, they need to send it a separate message every short period of time. That is a problem. So there are two types of optimizations here. The first and the trivial one is the hash chain, which I'm sure you know, where you use hashing to reduce the amount of signing. It's a bit similar to what people use for this, uh, the one-time signatures, right? Uh, so the CI is adding to the OCSP response, the hashing n times, you know, hashing of hashing of hashing for some random input X. So that's a hash n or a hashing, right? And then the, each time that you want to extend the OCS response, that is the certificate was still not re revoked, today also not revoked, you just expose one more pre-image. And that's uh, in that way, the same sig one signature can be used for many, many different times, by each time just exposing one more pre-image of this hash chain. So that is a very well-known trick of using hashing to extend this signature. That is one way, but we still need to send it separately for each uh, subject. It's a separate message for each subject. We need to maintain all this stuff. So it is a possible solution, right? It's, it, it does help it to some extent. Another solution will be, and, and that also does not kind of give us a real proof of it. Uh, the hash chain mechanism, we cannot prove later that it was sent at a particular time. Second mechanism is Merkel Digest. We have the same signature for many websites. In fact, we can have one signature for everybody. That allows us to reduce significantly the period also, yes? And we, I will, uh, well, I don't think I'll have time to talk about all three methods, but I'll discuss at least some of the methods of doing it with the Merkle Digest, okay? And before I do it, and I guess maybe that's the only thing I'll manage to do, will be to quickly recap on this, uh, you know, very widely used and rarely defined scheme of Merkle Digest, okay? So Merkle Digest schemes, so what we often refer to as Merkle trees, are uh, cryptographic schemes which contain at least these three functions. A digest function, which receives a set of messages and computes the digest, you know, this kind of hash of the entire set of messages with the collision resistant requirement, of course. So that's like an extension of a collision resistant hash function. And then two functions related to validation, validation of inclusion specifically. So these are two functions which allow us to validate that a particular item or message was in the set of input messages. So proof of inclusion computes this function, computes this proof of inclusion of a particular message and verify proof of inclusion, we'll verify the proof of inclusion. Now, both of these are mandatory, they're optimized. This is the heart of the American Digest uh, scheme, okay? And optional, we also have proof of non-inclusion and also proof of consistency. 
proof uh, with verification of proof consistency. So these are optional. We don't always use them. And in fact, for the uh, OCSP solution, we only use the proof of inclusion and verification of it. We don't need the more advanced stuff, proof non-inclusion or proof of uh, consistency. We actually do use in one variant proof of non-inclusion. Okay, and then we have the definition, which uh, obviously I shouldn't go over, but you you are welcome. In actually, I do come I present it in my textbook. That actually I just uh, stole it from my textbook. The definition of the American Digest scheme. So we define this scheme, and we define the correctness, as you would expect. You know, it correct if you if you very if you get the proof inclusion of a, of a set of messages and you verify it, it should be correct. Obviously, you should get true. And more importantly, you have the security property, which essentially says that you cannot have a collision and also you cannot generate an incorrect proof of inclusion, which again, we don't have time obviously to go over it, but of course, you're all very welcome to look them up and tell me which mistakes did they make. And it's quite common actually that they make mistakes, as some of you know. Right, so it's not, don't be very surprised, but uh, yeah, but I'm trying to avoid it. Anyway, we can also have a lot of constructions for these Merkle Digest schemes. Usually we talk about Merkle trees and actually there are several variants of Merkle trees. That's why we should, for these schemes, as for any cryptographic scheme, define the scheme in general and then define specific construction. Here's uh, one simple construction that achieves some properties, but not all of them efficiently which is just a two-layered Merkle tree, which you take the messages, you hash each message, and then you hash all of the hashes. That's just two layers, right? So very easy to see all the properties. It allows each user to receive and validate only the items it requires, which is easy to see. So I hope you see it, and you probably know it anyway, right? So this is the definition of these functions for this simple scheme, right? And then, uh, to verify inclusion of a particular message, we just need to have this particular message and the hashes of the other messages, and then we can check it easily, okay? Um, so that is the two-layer thing. Of course, we all know that usually we use a tree, which gives us uh, more efficient proofs that are shorter. We send less, sh less hashes of other messages by building it as, in, as a binary tree. And then the functions are slightly more complex, but still pretty easy, and we still have the proof of inclusion. For example, to prove inclusion of M3, we just provide M3, and the hashing is hash4 of M4, and hash12, which is essentially of hash M1 and M2, uh, where we just, we can't, you know, with another level of uh, hashing, right? So I'm sure that most of you are familiar with it. If you're not, then I, I think it's pretty, Hopefully you understood a bit of this approach and you're very welcome to read about it later. Uh, Merkle trees, of course, are mentioned and described in many, many places, many, many papers. Yeah. So let's just look at the solutions using Merkle trees. And the first of them is to use a tree of certificate statuses and proof of inclusion. So here, every, the tree will contain every certificate with a status. See here the list. Each leaf is certificate and its status, revoked, non-revoked, and so on. And we just prove inclusion of this leaf, C3, S3, proving that this the status of C3, of certificate 3, is whatever is written in S3. And to do that, we just need proof of inclusion in this tree, which is in this case H12, H4, and H528. And then we just need to sign this uh, the one signature for the hash of the or the digest of the, the entire tree, plus this proof of inclusion, three uh, blue things, and the uh, leaf itself. And that's it. We proved that this leaf has the following value. We prove your uh, proof inclusion. And that's much more efficient than you know, we have just one signature for all certificates and not too much data for each certificate also to prove uh, that it was not revoked or that it was revoked. Right. Solution two will be a tree only of revoked certificates with proof of non-inclusion. That is, each leaf contains the range of numbers of revoked certificates. So 10 is the first revoked, 20 is the next one revoked, 
30 is the next one he wrote, 40 is after this. So each, I put it here pairs, so you could have more than pairs, but this will be our numbers of revoked certificates, and the list is sorted by the serial numbers, and only the, these numbers in the list are revoked, okay? And now again, I can prove this particular leaf, for instance, 50, 60, and that proves that you don't have any revocation. None of the certificates between 50 and 60, for example, 55, was not revoked because then we would not have this leaf 50, 60. And what if I wanted to prove that certificate 70 was revoked? Then just the distance between 60 and 80. Right? So then I need to send two leaves and uh, proof of inclusion with just for these two leaves. But uh, no, that's not so bad. Uh, so I will I, I will hope that I will manage to finish. I think I'm almost at the end, if I remember correctly. So that is just, uh, we have some further, uh, okay, and solution three, although it says two, it is actually solution three, is a sign revocation bit miracle tree. So here, the leaves are just one bit, yes, zeros and ones, just one bit. And then the tree is this hashing of all of them. And again, we can prove the value of a particular bit. No, notice again, we have one leaf for every certificate, but these are the serial number of certificates. And this is the serial number space of certificates, which means that so there could be many, many leaves, more than certificates, actually. You don't restrict yourself to issued certificates. All the certificate number space of ZCA, you could have it here. Now, that may sound a waste, but actually, this can be easily optimized. <clears throat> In particular, a huge part of this tree will be zero, so you don't actually send them. You don't need to send these hashes. You, know, you can do also a trick which we call batching. Oh, if I didn't mention, this is actually techniques that we as part of, this, of the uh, PKI system that we are now developing, implementing, and uh, will be sending soon. So that's not yet even published, yes. But the results are extremely efficient of this uh, kind of hashing. As you can see, we have several further optimizations. And uh, for example, this batching where you have many certificates in the same leaf, and again, most of them are non-revoked. You have this kind of delta techniques. Right, so this brings you extremely uh, high efficiency for this uh, trick. We don't then send the zero hashes, we do the batches, extremely efficient, one signature, short messages, and very quick validation. Okay, so that's almost the end, but I just want to mention one other technique which is actually deployed already, which is short-term certificates. And that technique says, well, actually, if we do this, this uh, uh, OCSP for each certificate individually in the short validity period. So why don't we just have short validity period for the certificate? Don't we don't, don't need OCSP? We don't need anything. We never revoke certificates. We just don't extend them. All of the tricks that I've mentioned could be deployed just directly on the certificate with appropriate extensions. Just instead of calling it OCSP, call it certificate, right? Do it in the, the, in the initial certificate. In fact, this will be more efficient because you only need to validate one signature of the CA, not to validate separately a signature of the CA on the certificate and the signature of the CA on the, uh, on the OCSP response. So it's even more efficient, right? So it's definitely a good idea to do it. It's already wide. You could deploy it right now without optimization. That's true. But you could deploy it immediately by issuing certificates for a very short period, right? So people are using it. It is mentioned actually in some of the websites of the browsers. And you can do all the optimization that I mentioned. So, you know, we cryptographers don't need to worry about our optimizations. They can still be deployed with this solution. Okay. Uh, so I give you some example of the hash chain, but all of the techniques I mentioned could be deployed with short-term certificates as well. Okay. So just one important comment. Revocation, as I, that I discussed all all of today assumes a honest CA. A rogue CA can fail to revoke. And if it fails to revoke, it can allow an attacker to use the exposed key. That is, of course, just one of the many possible attacks of a rogue CA, which will be our topic for tomorrow. And indeed, I will discuss this particular attack. This is not just an attack which is you know, a typical rogue CA attack. This is actually an attack that the 
standards, the certificate transparency standards that I talk quite a lot tomorrow, the, the current standard actually completely does not address this particular concern, but it is obviously it should, of course, do it. So we will discuss it also tomorrow. Okay, so that will be tomorrow, CA failures and then certificate transparency with all of its uh, variants. Thank you very much.